So we're going to be talking about digital, the opportunities that exist in this part of the world, a $200 billion market within a few years, one that could add a trillion dollars over time to the ASEAN economy. And I'm thrilled by the panel that we have on stage today because they represent all walks of life in this very interesting, exciting arena. Tony Fernandez, uh, the founder, CEO, and inspiration behind Air Asia. He, Air Asia. he has dressed up for the occasion. So those of you who saw Tony earlier will know that that is a statement of fact. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that compliments are already rolling, I know. <laughs> John Riadi, um, executive director of Lippo Group. Someone who firsthand has been wrestling by what does this mean for the incumbents? And you've taken quite a few interesting steps, Mata Hari, et cetera. Looking forward to hearing more about that. Hui <coughs> Ling, uh, who is the co-founder of Grab. Many of you will know and have used Grab. Hui Ling is the chief operating officer, and she was there from the start, from the business plan at HBS, I believe, if not before. Not too long ago. Say again? Not too long ago. Not too long ago. That's Certainly a lot less time ago than I was there. Welcome. And then Jaime Ayala from the Ayala Corporation, chairman and CEO. The Philippines' leading conglomerate covers many sectors, many of which are, of course, impacted by the disruption that we'll talk about today. And the second Harvard Business School graduate on the panel, in addition to myself and Hui Ling. So a call out for our school. John, I believe you went to some other school in the United States. I'm not sure which one. But not HBS, right? Others. Another one. Wharton. Any Wharton people? Okay, we'll move on. Right, um, the first thing we're going to do is we have a question, a polling question, to get us all into the spirit of the conversation. Now, the question is as follows, so listen carefully. How confident are you of the growth potential arising from the confluence of rapid digital adoption and the rise of consumption power in Southeast Asia? That's the polling question. Another way of thinking about it, are you optimistic about digital in Southeast Asia? One to five, five being extremely optimistic, one being less optimistic. If you can just enter onto the app and you should be able to enter your thoughts, five being very positive, one being less so. Well, there we go. This panel can be really quick. Highly confident, 96%. Uh -huh. All right, let's see if we can keep that 96. Oh, it's going down, 88. There we go. We've got 10. Looks like it's 90, 10, somewhere in that zone. Let's see if we can keep that number up, okay? Well, why don't we start with that question? Let's get the panel underway. Tony, how do you think about that question and why, why do you see it the way you see it? Well, I mean, well, for me, you know, AirAsia started as a digital company 16 years ago. We were one of the first airlines to, in Southeast Asia to uh, use the web. And as of today, still 85% of our business is, is through the web. And uh, so we saw the potential of unifying the consumer through the internet by creating AirAsia.com, and it has been our main growth pattern. We also saw that here was a chance of retaining our relationship with the customer as opposed to breaking it through travel agents, et cetera. So, you know, 16 years ago, we had 200,000 people flying with us. This year, we'll have 90 million people flying with us. That's really a reflection of the strength of the growth of the digital um, power in Southeast Asia. So I'm very, very optimistic, and of course there's so many more companies that have now come along, and we've been able to treat Southeast Asia, or ASEAN, I, I really do believe in ASEAN tremendously, uh, as a single customer through our website. Everyone goes through the same website uh, throughout ASEAN. So I'm very, very optimistic, and I ec echo the sentiments uh, that have been reflected in the voting. So does, does that mean there'll be more investment by AirAsia, your business in digital and related technologies? But very much. We've, you know, I'm, I'm desperately trying to tell everyone we're not an, we're not an airline. We're like not Grab. Airline. We're like Grab. So we get the same kind of valuation. And, <laughs> How's know, that going? Are people buying that story? Or you know, we you... make more money, okay, but right. we're like 10% worth of what Grab is. So, um, okay. So yesterday, I was thrilled that Milken put me on a digital panel, you know, with all these Life is young, good. hip companies. And um, so we, the, the great thing about data uh, now, this, this whole data revolution, is that the, the, the data we get, the resolution is very high. And so now, you know, while a lot of the internet companies have to spend a fortune in acquiring customers, we actually are making money from our customers by moving them around. And so we're taking all that data and we're building three or four 
different platforms to monetize our customers more and provide them more services, whether it's through uh, fintech, whether it's through e-commerce, um, logistics, and uh, uh, tokenizing our loyalty points to make it uh, more utility. Right. Uh, on top of that, we see the mobile part of the whole interaction growing, and so we're investing a tremendous amount in terms of using data to make the passenger's experience better and also uh, to make it easier to transact with us. So big, big believers in, in what's happening in the digital side. And I think this enables us, and Grab has shown the way, uh, uh, along with many other companies, to create this Southeast Asian consumer, this ASEAN consumer, right. and breaking down these huge amount of invisible barriers we have that is stopping us from really milking the potential of uh, ASEAN. Terrific. And if I can remind everyone, if you want to submit a question, please do. We'll get to questions from the pad and also from the group uh, shortly. John, from an incumbent's perspective, your answer to the question, optimistic, and if so, why? I'm, I'm extremely optimistic. Um, I, I believe that if we all went to sleep today and woke up 20 years from now, we would not recognize uh, the corporate landscape in Indonesia. I think in every single sector, in every single industry, we'll see new players, and if they were old players, they'd be doing completely new things. So I think over the next 20 years, we're gonna, we're gonna see the largest shift uh, in the corporate landscape in Indonesia that Indonesia has ever seen over the last you know, 70 years of its history. And you know, for, for, for our group today, uh, we uh, essentially are a consumer services group. Last year, we served 60 million unique Indonesians uh, and generated about 10,000 uh, transactions every minute of the day. Uh, and yet, I think we see the digital opportunity as the, as the largest opportunity that presents itself in Indonesia today. Um, four years ago, we started on this, 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 the, this big digital push, uh, and it's essentially a three-pronged approach. It's an investment approach, a build approach, and a transformation approach. We set up a venture capital fund um, to invest in Southeast Asian early stage startups. Amongst our most successful investments are, are Grab. And I think the, the, the amazing uh, thing about this is that not only, uh, not only is this an opportunity to, I think, make a lot of money, but also it's an opportunity to learn. I think the challenge with a lot of the larger group is oftentimes you, you, you know, we're, we're stuck in our own world, not realizing that the whole world is passing by us. But by investing, we meet new ideas, new entrepreneurs, new companies, and that helps us understand what's going on today. So that's the investment part of what we do. But in addition, we've also been building digital companies. We've been building digital companies um, not from within our traditional companies, but on its own. So as a, as a separate entity, separate team, separate culture, even a separate office building to allow them to, to create their own culture. Um, and then the third is transforming our companies. I think every single one of our companies uh, must transform uh, if it is to survive. And I think the interesting thing is whether it's from our investment side, whether it's from, from our build side or from our, our traditional company side, it's slowly all coming together. Um, and uh, two years ago, we launched a company called Ovo, uh, which today, in partnership with Grab, uh, we are the largest uh, payments company in Indonesia. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see you know, how, the, how fast the, the consumer in Indonesia is embracing uh, uh, new technologies and new ways of doing things. Uh, so I'm very excited, uh, and I think this presents uh, us uh, the, 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 a huge opportunity for the future. Terrific. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Wheeling, grab, maybe a moment and grab, but also from your perspective, your optimism. Well, I have to be optimistic because the entire company is built on mobile technology and driving that forward for Southeast Asia. Um, to be honest, I think we're in a very fortunate position to have caught that wave at the, the right time, right? With the right, I guess, inefficiencies in the market that enable mobile technology to help bring more efficiencies to the customer. What do I mean by this, right? And why is it particularly relevant for Southeast Asia? Southeast Asia across the board has a challenge of infrastructure, um, where you know, the markets historically have been uh, underdeveloped, if you go outside of Singapore, Singapore. And when you are trying to grow really quickly, building roads, building br brick and mortar buildings, it it's, takes much faster to innovate and develop than technology in the digital world. So what we've been able to do with this technology is help 
bridge that, what we call the O2O bridge, online to offline. What you used to have to do with direct physical interactions of you know, hailing a cab, going to the bank to get a check, deposit money, you know, going to a restaurant to get food, going to see a doctor you know, you know, 10 kilometers away, these things now with mobile technology, we can make significantly more efficient by O2O transitions. So with Grab right now, thankfully, you can you know, e-hail. You can you know, do wallet uh, cashless tran transactions. You can pay your friend, give your, your, your friends food for dinner and lunch and whatnot. And all of these things are what we believe are future areas of growth that have only just started, right? And think about the amount of time that we can help save everyone in Southeast Asia if we can make each of these interactions more and more efficient with the digital technology. So we started on that journey from a transportation perspective. Um, our initial ambitions were very naive, some say. We wanted to make transportation more safe in, in Malaysia. We knew there was a broader ambition uh, and potential for Southeast Asia, and thankfully we've been been able to attain that over the last six years. And because of that trust that we've built right now, and that combination of hyper-local talent and global best-in-class technology with you know, six R&D centers, including the states, China, India, Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, what we're hoping to do is provide access to, to that customer base, that distribution network that we now have, to as many partners as possible. Today, I'm very, very fortunate to sit on an entire panel of existing partners and ongoing partners and hopefully folks that we can continue working with even more going forward um, by thinking about new, smarter ways to serve the customers of Southeast Asia. Terrific. We'll come back to talk about partners, friends, competition, and all that goes with it. Jaime, again, the Philippines, well-established business, been going for over 100 years, strong heritage, Lots of disruption out there. How are you responding and why are you optimistic? Yeah. Well, let me just start by saying that I'm in complete agreement with Tony, John, and, and, and Wheeling. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those massive optimists about these changes, and it's uh, created a sense of excitement in, 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 in a new way of dealing, I guess, with, with services and opportunities that I think we didn't face in the past. I think the biggest issue that we have to take into account, um, Kevin, is the demographic change. I mean, Southeast Asia in general is growing, but you've also got all these young people. I mean, in the Philippines, 50% of our population is under the age of 25. And that demographic shift or that demographic structure, I think, is a major driver of the changes that we're seeing. Um, young people are adept, they're, they're comfortable uh, dealing with technology. Uh, the learning curves are very short. And if there's anything driving that, even I'm sure the clients of Grab and the like, um, these are individuals who are very, very comfortable uh, with this new way of doing things. They have a different way of working, they have a different way of consuming information, which is just so, uh, so um, I guess, uh, perfect, I guess, for this for technological storm. The second thing is information just moves so quickly now that new ideas cross borders very, very quickly. People get excited by these new ways of doing things, and we all gather information on a daily basis about new ways of doing things, and this information is shared among entrepreneurs, large institutions, uh, governments, and uh, that whole movement, I guess, of, of ideas is just far, more, uh, far quicker now. Um, the other thing is, um, and talking about the larger institutions, um, our balance sheets are stronger. Uh, we're able to transform, we're able to invest in capital and, and do what's needed. And uh, finally, I think as Willing was saying, um, the imperfections in the infrastructure that we all have, and this goes across the board, not just in transportation, allows disruption to take place probably more easily than it would under normal circumstances. Um, as a multi-business group, we have numerous touch points, um, a wide customer base, and uh, the moment you start thinking about new ways of, of, of uh, tackling their needs, as long as you have the right information technology and infrastructure base to do so, it just opens up a plethora of new opportunities at different price points. So, um, like my three colleagues, I'm, I'm, I'm massively optimistic. Okay, well, let me see if I can temper some of that optimism. I'll use a question that's come in, an abbreviated version of it. What about the responsibility to respect consumer privacy? Doesn't that provide some limit on the scale of the opportunity that we're discussing? Consumer privacy. Sorry, we're struggling consumer with your rights, Scottish accent. Consumer rights, data protection. We don't understand you. 
You don't speak Scottish? No. There's too much echo in, in, the, in, the, in the feedback. Consumer privacy. Ah. OK, does that translate? Yeah. Good. I know you were educated in England, which is a strange place at the best of times, so we'll move on. Right. What about that? Doesn't that provide some limit to the optimism? There's going to be constraints, there's going to be concerns, cyber attacks, relentless optimism in the face of all of that. Tony. Well, you know, I've been going through this, as I said at the beginning, for about 16 years. And at the beginning, we didn't even have payment mechanisms to, to pay. So, of course, there are threats. Of course, there's going to be more regulation on, on privacy issues. Um, I think the biggest one that you've just mentioned is cybersecurity, and that, that is a, a huge issue. We're, we're attacked every day um, on bots and the like. So, but I mean, you know, we'll find a way. I think the, the positive sides of this digital revolution are just so exciting that um, people will find a way. There are a lot of clever people out there. Privacy is um, an interesting one, but from a consumer's perspective, I think as long as you do it correctly, I don't see any issue on that because you're providing a service and most of these people want that service anyway. So I don't see it as a, as a major issue. I do worry about governments getting more involved. I think the ability for Grab to have gone and built an ASEAN business so quickly vis-a-vis yeah. -vis what AirAsia has to go through, where we are so regulated, with ownership regulations and nationalism and protectionism uh, really shows the way forward that Grab has produced an Asian business, which they own 100% everywhere. They've been able to raise capital. They've been able to provide a service um, which has benefit, benefited the people of ASEAN and provided a lot of jobs. So I worry that governments will start interfering and controlling and regulating and the pace of um, innovation will slow down and the pace of change will slow down. The digital world has shown what ASEAN can be, you know, because you are getting many more ASEAN companies and showing the power of the ASEAN market of 700 million people, which, you know, we saw 17 years ago. Uh, but we have a much harder battle in trying to deploy capital efficiently because of these really anarchic right. rules, you know. Um, you know, many, many years ago, uh, when Malaysia and Indonesia were having some spat, the president of Indonesia said to me, Tony, what would happen if Malaysia goes to war? Who would you support? I said, very easy, Bapa. AirAsia, Indonesia would move the Indonesian soldiers, and AirAsia, Malaysia would move the Malaysian soldiers. We are truly ASEAN. <laughs> so, um, you know, but some of those rules date back to that, and I think the way forward that Grab and Gojek and all these dynamic companies that are creating ASEAN multinationals is the way forward for ASEAN. It does show the power that Asia is not just about China and India, but this wonderful market of consumption of 700 million people that has built AirAsia from two planes to 230 planes, but could be much better if governments started to bring down these invisible barriers and I hope they don't put up new barriers for um, the, the grabs of the world and the okay. gojeks of the world and the future e-commerce. If you look at an ASEAN e-commerce company um, versus Alibaba, they have 1.3 billion consumers with one single market. An e-commerce provider in ASEAN has to go through 10 different customs authorities to move products around. We talk about a single window, but the reality is something different. So those are the threats more than cybersecurity and privacy. Well, well let's pick up on that point, because there's, there's a theme in some of the questions I'm getting on the iPad. Hui Ling, you're competing with some pretty big global competitors, whether it's the Chinese with Didi or the Americans with Uber. Or how do you see, as an ASEAN-based unicorn, competing with these massive platform-based providers who've got huge consumer markets of their own? Well, I think... Firstly, let me reframe the question, if you don't mind. Please. Apologies um, if, if I take this too cheekily. Um, yes, we were competing with probably the biggest um, competitor the world has ever seen from a technology space, especially from a ride-hailing space. Uh, they were the fastest, largest growing startup, and they were Uber, right? Uh, thankfully, earlier this year, we've now become partners. 
uh, they decided to invest into us because they know that Southeast Asian needs are best served by Grab. Um, and it born out of multiple years of trying to outserve the same customers as best as we could, and they realized that we had a better hold of it because of our what we call hyperlocal teams. Right? I'll go back to a similar theme I mentioned earlier. Southeast Asia is so diverse, right? Again, we sit here in Singapore, which looks completely different from, you know, Bangkok, Manila, Jakarta, Bali, Manado, right? Every single city is different, and therefore, it required very nuanced approaches that only locals could understand, and that's why we bring the best leaders and talent together for that. What we do do as well is complement with them with the best technology capabilities. At the end of this year, we'll have close to what we call 2,000 uh, technologists. These are software engineers, data scientists, designers, product managers. This is a scale that no other local technology company has ever seen before, and we're hoping to continue growing this talent locally as well. We also kick-started a Grab NUS AI lab just a few months ago, because we know it is so critical for us to continue complementing this local customer needs with global technology infrastructure to serve our customers better. Competition ultimately is a byproduct of trying to serve customers with the next new better alternative, right? And we therefore welcome competition and partners alike because we, we find them as the best ways to learn faster and faster. So you mentioned China and the States. Uh, thankfully, on our board right now, we have Uber and Didi, both as shareholders and board members. Um, so what we've done is to actually take the other approach. Again, partnership first. How can we bring these global behemoths and folks who have so much knowledge on their own that we can learn from and that we can also share with to work together. That's what we've always believed in. And John, as a question relates to that, which given what you said about invest, build and transform, how did you think about partnership with these new players versus just trying to compete and get the market for yourself anyway? I think partnerships is key. Um, you can, I think it's, it's easy to underestimate the complexity of digital businesses. You, from the customer perspective, he or she might look at it the same way. I'm buying um, a shirt, or I want to get from point A to point B. But I think the difference in serving that same customer or the delivery of that in the new digital model, I think it's vastly different. So I think, and, and, I, and, and given the speeds at which the industry moves, uh, you may not have time to build those capabilities. So the best way to do it is to partner. Um, so I think partnership is, is, is very critical. And I think ultimately, it's not about technology per se. It's about the customer. Uh, I think it's easy to get caught into this technology spin. But I think in reality, we try to always challenge ourselves each day to think about what does the customer want? How can we better serve the customer? And today, a lot of that has to be done through technology. So I, uh, technology certainly is a, is a critical instrument to better serve the customer and to innovate. But I think at the end of the day, it's still about that customer and how do you serve that customer, give, give, him, give him or her what he or she wants through whatever channel is, is most convenient and at the best price possible. Thank you. Uh, Jaime, a question for you, building on the theme of demographics that you started us on. One of the characteristics of economic development has been growing inequality. Will we see an, an increasing digital divide between those who have access and those who do not? And how does that color your thinking about this development? I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. Actually, I am more of the school that this will close the digital divide rather than make it wider. I think products and services are becoming far more accessible at whole different price points uh, in this modern economy. People are competing to bring costs down, make things easier. Um, so I think it's the opposite. You take a country like ours where 80% of our country remains unbanked. Very few people have credit cards. Very few people act, have access to, uh, uh, to banking services. 
Um, uh, following John, we also opted for a partnership model in some of these new technologies. We tied up with Ant Financial, who bought into an exi existing uh, uh, mobile uh, wallet platform that we had through our Globe Telecom in the Philippines. And we're working together, bringing some of the skills and, and some of the algorithms that they have and, and, and some of the market that we'd already developed. And we're, uh, our, our, our proposition uh, is really to the lower end of the market. Um, and not only are we uh, creating, I guess, uh, uh, transfer of funds and, and value created models at, at different price points, we're creating remittance products, and we're also creating lending products uh, to small scale uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, this was unheard of in the banking system. You had uh, 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 institutions that were dedicated to this with a much smaller footprint. Our capacity to bridge that divide for people that are unbanked um, uh, is, I think, much higher now with these new technologies rather than than not. Um, mobile phones have now become uh, a way of learning, a way of accessing the internet far more than it was five to ten years ago. Um, and most people already have a mobile phone. Smartphone penetration is moving up uh, exponentially. People will have access to the same information that others have at a different price point. Um, the last point I wanted to make, um, and, and maybe following uh, comments from my colleagues, uh, is I think we mustn't forget also all the interesting externalities uh, that come with these businesses. It's not just about technology per se, but how systems and products and the movement of things are changing. Uh, you take a country like ours, uh, you know, we have a lot of bricks and mortar, we run a lot of uh, commercial centers that are very traditional, so we've decided to invest uh, in the e-commerce space. That is still a very small component, I guess, of, of the e-commerce population in the Philippines, but the reason it hasn't succeeded is that there's a lack of logistics uh, to support, I guess, this change. So we've decided to invest heavily uh, in, in the logistics space, but using modern technology to make it more efficient. Um, there are a lot of these externalities, and I'm sure it affects uh, my colleagues here, that are just as interesting as the technology itself. Uh, people are changing the way things get done, and sometimes the support systems, like logistics, uh, to enable success uh, in these new uh, uh, opportunities are not necessarily there. And I think there's an opportunity as well to develop those. Okay. I'll take one more digital question, then I'll make sure we take some questions from the room. But for um, a question for Tony and also for John, how do you enable leaders that grew up analog? Because Tony, your company did start 16 years ago. How did they grow up analog effectively now lead in a digital world? Tony? Or John? John Rosa. It's a good question, uh, Ke uh, <clears throat> Kevin, and, and, and one that we ask ourselves as we evaluate the many leaderships of our companies. But I, I look at the distinction not between leaders who are analog and leaders who are digital, but instead between leaders who understand the cons consumer and leaders who don't. Leaders who are customer focused and leaders who, are, who aren't. Leaders who are customer obsessed and leaders who aren't. I think to me, that's the more critical distinction. Um, and I find leaders, managers, operators who have that customer obsession, the technology part, you can learn, uh, you can adopt, you can partner with. Uh, but I think it's, it's that insight about the customer that is ultimately the most important. And then, obviously, once you, you understand that customer, how do you innovate to serve the customer? And then only thirdly, how do you have operational excellence to scale that innovation ac across the organization. But I think first and foremost, it's about finding leaders who understand the customer, who's got a passion for that customer. Um, and then I think the rest will follow. I, I have a, a slightly different view in that, <clears throat> that the whole subject of digital is huge. It's uh, from you looking at your iPad and Jaime's on a piece of paper and the three of us have nothing. And, and, so, and so you, uh, you know, what does digital mean? And I think um, it is tough. I mean, and I, you know, I've been doing it for a long, long time. We, we forced people onto the internet um, when there was no real internet. Uh, but I don't think my company has gone through that cultural change fully because now digital is a lot more than having an iPad right. or using a computer. You know, it's what cloud is bringing in. And how do you use those tools? We, we're, we have a big relationship with Google and Palantir. Um, and you know, we spent the last three years 
repiping everyone so, so we have the right data. We have, we're fantastic data, but you've got to get it into a position that you can use it. Now we're doing that, it's changing the mindset of the people who are still used to using Excel spreadsheets and you know, man, a lot of manual things into using AI and machine learning. And it's not easy. It's, it's quite tough. It has to be done in a dictatorial fashion. Um, in some ways, you, you, you really have to because Southeast Asia and ASEAN don't like change. They're, they're creatures of comfort. Um, and so it's, it's a buzzword. It's like the innovation buzzword, but it's a hard slog. But in the end, um, with a little bit of a stick, with a little bit of carrot, you'll get there when you start seeing the benefits and you begin to show examples of because Grab is one step ahead of us, or maybe two steps ahead of us, because they've, you know, when they came in, that whole data revolution was already there. So it's a big challenge. And data is a sexy word, just like innovation was a sexy word a, a few years ago. You know, I'd say you have to create the environment for innovation. Uh, and for us, we did strange things. You know, we didn't have officers. We wanted to be transparent. We dressed down. Um, you know, it caused me lots of problems in the airport because people thought I was an illegal immigrant. Um, running around, you know, I've just jumped off a plane. Uh, but, but we wanted to create an environment of, of very low friction. And now we're going to do the same thing again with this whole digital thing. And it's, it's a massive job. It's not easy. And I think that's a challenge as well. Well, Hui Lang, I've actually got the opposite question for you, and then I will go to the floor. Are there any analog people at Grab, brackets, over 40, like many of us in this room? I think over 40 is a very generous interpretation of this room. <laughs> <laughs> Wheeling. I will not judge on that comment. No. But, no. To be frank and honest, we have many tremendous experienced leaders, and we actually look for them. Um, because I think ultimately what we want in our leadership team is a diversity of thoughts, a diversity of representation from the wide range of customers that we're serving, and also a diverse set of leadership skills that they bring on board. Um, for us, we've hired folks who've come from, you know, more standard airline-like uh, backgrounds, more standard construction, logistics, the old, what you might call the old industries, wow. right? But to us... We're old already, John. <laughs> <laughs> speak, speak for yourself, Tony. <laughs> Will you keep going, please? I think at this point in time, nothing I can say will come out right. <laughs> um, so I'll just put a big caveat. I'm saying this uh, all in the interest of sharing what we're doing, uh, whether it's right or not, and how it represents on the rest of the panel or the room. Please don't judge, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we do have a lot of very experienced leaders, and in fact, we celebrate them. Um, and I think we also do have a lot of very young millennials, which are very challenging to manage as well, even from a personal perspective. Going forward, for us, stepping back, what does it mean, right? What does it take to actually build an everlasting, evergreen company that could go beyond the generations, not just focus on what it has been over the last you know, six years for us, but more like the next 60? For that to happen, I think what we just need to do is make sure we're continuously bringing in leaders who want to learn and know how to change and innovate and test and make mistakes. The one thing we have done a lot of at Grab, forget about the good news you hear um, in the articles or on the panels, right? Think about all the freaking hard work and all the mistakes that we've made that we then had to go recorrect, learn from, painfully say we were very, very wrong, and then try something new again, right? If we can set up an entire organization that from, from whatever country, whatever level, whatever function, can continuously do that in a collaborative fashion, internally and externally as well, being super hyper-focused on our customers, leveraging the latest technology or the latest operational know-how, that is what's gonna get us to the next, you know, the next version of ourselves and it will enable us to be what we call evergreen and multi-generational. Okay, let me see if we've got a question from the room. Any questions from the room? Yes, there's one over there. I can't actually see. Thank you. Um, I share the excitement of the panelists on you know, the potential of this new economy. Um, and Jaime mentioned about the demographics of having younger and younger people as customers. 
I just want to ask the panelists, how about the older people? How about the, the senior citizen officers, not the leaders, but senior citizen customers who are analog, may not be able to convert themselves into this digital world. Are we heading to a world, a future where instead of being pushed in wheelchairs, older people will have to be held by their children or grandchildren mm -hmm. to be able to navigate you know, and, and consume through the digital platform? Jaime? Um, I, I uh, thank you, Lito, for that question, and, and I think it, it builds on something Tony was saying earlier, which is you can put all the hardware in, you can invest in all the technology, but not everybody adjusts to all of this that easily. I think uh, what, what Lito is saying is, is actually a tremendous opportunity. I think the whole field of education is going to change dramatically. I think there's a need for massive reskilling, and I don't think it's from the traditional education institutions. I think we will have to reinvent education institutions for a whole new generation to get people up to speed. Um, these will be technical certificates, new ways of looking at things. Even the whole field of data analysis is still so new and still within the purview of PhDs and, and sophisticated people. Uh, but eventually, it'll come down to a different set of individuals. Uh, I think what this opens up is, is, as I said, there are many externalities that will be affected by all these changes in technology. I mentioned logistics is just one of many. I think education, Alito, will be one, and I think it's going to have to dramatically shift. I think the, the, the disconnect between the educational systems of today and the employment needs of tomorrow is massive. Uh, but rather than see that as a problem, uh, I see that as an opportunity, and we have started to invest in that space and create uh, ways of bridging, uh, bridging that, that, that disconnect that currently exists. I'm not saying all educational institutions are disconnected from the employment space, but I'm just saying that that's become wider. And I think it goes back to your point. There is a need for reskilling generationally, and there's a need for reskilling for completely new jobs. And I think that's an opportunity for all of us. Okay, a question over here, Martin. Do we have a mic down at the front? Right, right down at the front. If you can shout, we might, maybe I can just repeat it. Okay, the rise of Alibaba and Amazon threatens to distance or mediate established brands. So what should brands do in the light of that challenge and threat? I think it was roughly that. Um, who wants to take that one? Tony. Uh, I, think, I, I think as everyone's been talking about the customers, as long as you have that from the very early stages, we always said we must have that direct link with the customer and provide the value and the service. And just going back to Lito's question, I don't think whether you're young or old, if you put a good deal people will find a way to get to that deal and they'll learn how to, to do it. Uh, I said yesterday at a, at a panel, you know, um, during SARS, everyone thought they were going to die and uh, no one would fly. But I knew Malaysians very well. If you put a fare low enough, they will risk their lives. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, you know, there was no discrimination between young and old. We, 800 ringgit to Kota Kinabalu, I'm going to die. 80 ringgit, I'll buy so it. We're all willing to die. I'll find it. Fantastic. You know, we're a tough, resilient Fantastic. lot in Malaysia. So um, I don't see the age issue as a, as a problem. Yes, the workforce is, is very important. But I think in, in dealing with um, Amazon and Alibaba, it's, it's the service you provide to your customer. But the disintermediation point, I mean, you're an established brand, business, Lippo, and you've got a broad array of assets, as you partner, you are putting somebody between you and the, or potentially putting somebody between you and your customer. Do you worry about that? Or? So I think one of, the, one of the impacts of the digitization of the economy, uh, Martin, I think is disintermediation. So I believe if, if your business is simply an intermediary, I think you'll get cut off. And I think the Amazons, the Alibabas of this world, I think will disrupt you. But I do think that if you, are, if you have a brand and you've got merchandise and you've got strong brands, I think customers still ultimately go for that. Um, take Zara, for example, one of the strongest brands in, in retail. Sure, I think right now all these brands are debating, should I be on the Alibaba platform, should I not? If I do, what are the economics? So there's always going to be that, I think, that tension um, between brands and platforms. 
But I, I but I think in in the digital world more than ever, brands are are, are going to be even more critical. So I think as we look at our businesses, we we ask ourselves that same question. You know, what is the value add that you bring to the customer? Uh, what's your reason that we should continue to exist in in this world of disintermediation? But I think if you have products, you've got brands. Um, I think the, in the digital world, you you will thrive. Okay. Um, any more questions on the floor? I'll go all the way over there. Thank you. I run a, a quantum technology company, and I'm inspired by many of the things that you've achieved in your companies. One thing that I worry about, and I'm curious for your view, is given the panel's discussion earlier about the risks posed by cybersecurity threats and concerns over privacy, uh, what view do you have in terms of a risk to your businesses associated with governments now mandating weakening of security, for instance, in Australia? Weakening security. Weakening encryption. Weakening of security in, in yeah. Australia? We might need some help with what that. What do you one. mean by weakening yes. of security in Australia? Government mandates to weaken encryption. Ah. Who would like to say that? I'm not familiar with the specifics of the, the situation in Australia, but you know, I think as, as a number of people have alluded to uh, in this panel, I think data is probably the most important ingredient uh, to unleashing uh, the power, the full potential of the digital world. And I look at data and privacy more optimistically to say that look at what data can do to increase access to capital. Look what data can do to allow people to, you know, who, who previously were unbanked and now they can, they, they can, have, they can take out loans uh, with unprecedented speeds and things like that. And in a market like Indonesia, uh, the, the, the impact on society of that is huge. Um, so I, I look at uh, uh, all the, the positive sides of what data has to offer to the, to the customer and to increasing people's livelihoods. Uh, sure, I think uh, the, the, the downside or the risk there uh, is cybersecurity, uh, hacking, things like that. Um, and and, and uh, that's the new reality we live in. Um, uh, the good thing with markets like Indonesia, I think it's coming from uh, one side of the extreme where data is very, very still very loosely regulated. I think that will change and I think the government must find the right balance. Uh, that at the same time protects customers, but at the same time also allows uh, data to, to become the ingredient uh, to unleash uh, the digital potential. Okay, we've only got time for one last question, which I'll ask each panelist to use as the closing question. Seven unicorns across the whole of ASEAN. Seven unicorns, seven billion dollar plus valuation uh, digital economy players. Why aren't there more and what will it take? And I'm afraid we'll have to do this in 30 seconds each. Start with Jaime. Yeah. I think um, uh, the winners in this, in this technology space and, and, and these startups, they're, they're few. They're, they're only a very few. If you look at it uh, from a statistical point of view, there are very few who really make it to the kind of scale that succeeds. However, in the process, there are a lot of new learnings and a lot of new ways of doing things. Um, I just think there's a, uh, there's a winner-take-all mentality that happens in the technology field, but that shouldn't prevent us from continuing to invest in the space. With every investment, even the ones that don't fully succeed, there's a learning that takes place, and I think that's important for organizations like ours. Tony, 30 seconds. I, I think capital um, and this single market that I keep talking about to create scale. Uh, innovation, plenty. I mean, Gojet, um, Uber's copying them. They started the bicycles and the scooters first. So there's plenty of innovation here, plenty of talent. I think access to capital and creating this ASEAN market is uh, an impediment to more unicorns. John? Uh, I think there are only seven because we're only at the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think, again, if you look, look at uh, ASEAN and Indonesia over the next 20 years, I, I have no doubt we'll see 20, 30, 40 unicorns. I think the pace at which innovation is transforming industries is, is unprecedented and will only gain pace. Um, so I think there'll be a lot more to come. We like a final word with you. I agree with John, but I wanted to broaden to another topic that Tony touched on. Um, I think the concept of regulations, it's here to stay. There is a reason why governments are working so hard to figure out what's the right balance between innovation, customer needs, and customer protection. 
I think the challenge is, historically, regulations were set once and did not change for decades. Going forward, what we need to do is figure out how to make regulations change at the speed, the same speed of which technology, startups, and, and all of that is happening as well. And I think for this, I actually do want to commend um, the Singapore government for this, right? Um, MAS has set up a MAS Payments Council where they've brought together uh, folks, whether the leading banks, the leading financial technology players, you know, associations from different business uh, groups, and Grab's, you know, glad to be one of them, to talk about this as quickly as possible so that we can co-create together, right? That's one part. The second part, and if there's one thing for us to learn from, from China, is that there needs to be space to fail. I, I want to re-emphasize this because no success will come from 100% sure wins. All of us need to test, iterate, learn, grow. And for that to happen, again, whether it's more sandboxes, more regulatory pilots, more discussions at the working level, I, I think that will continue to encourage whether it's more unicorns at startups or whether it's more existing companies and conglomerates to continue in innovating. That's what we need to build. Well, thank you, Huiling. A compliment to the Singapore government sounds like a good place to end. So a big thank you to our panel.